Advancements in artificial technology, intelligence technology, has its pros and cons, but deep fakes and the dangers they pose certainly make the cons list as distinct from the pros. How do you tell the difference between authentic images and videos from deep fakes? Well, I'm joined in studio by Barry Scannell, AI expert and senior solicitor with William Fry's Technology Group. Barry, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Thanks for having me on. How long have these deep fakes been on the go? Well, in some ways, if you consider the likes of Photoshop, deepfakes have been around for a long time because there's been nothing stopping people taking somebody's face and just pasting it onto an image of someone else. But in terms of artificial intelligence technology, um, the explosion in deepfakes has really accompanied the explosion in generative AI that we've seen in the last couple of years. And the problem is with these fakes, they are so deep that they are to the ordinary eye um, that they are not detectable. Absolutely. I mean, uh, many of your listeners, I'm sure, will have seen that picture of the Pope in a puffer jacket, this big, yeah. long, white, shiny thing. And I saw it and I thought nothing of it because, I mean, I just assumed that they might have a flair for uh, the theatrical, maybe, in the Vatican. Um, but it didn't necessarily seem amiss to me that I would necessarily think, oh, that must be a deep fake. It turns out it was. And it was a particularly good one. And there was nothing particularly damaging about it and it was fine. But then, for example, around the time of Trump's indictment. Plenty of images started coming out about, you know, fake images of Trump being arrested or running away from the police in mm. Central Park in New York. And again, most people realised these were deep fake images because they were almost humorous in nature. But it's that middle ground where something potentially is within context but, but and seems potentially realistic. Yeah. So, for example, AI technology is being used a lot in the Ukraine war and um, President Zelensky, for example, deep fake technology is being used to replicate images of him, videos of him and his voice. And one of the Ukrainian TV stations was hacked and played a deep fake video of President Zelensky telling Ukrainians to surrender, for example. And, wow. you know, now that didn't get any traction, obviously, but um, that's where we're heading. And you see, people are more credulous when it comes to video because because of the likes of Photoshop, we've become more a little bit conscientious, I guess, in terms of whether or not to believe what we see in terms of imagery. But yeah. video has always, always been difficult. But like now you we're see a, a picture of a, a female vocalist with impossibly long legs and, you know, they've been stretched by Photoshop, but they can do that now in video. Yeah, so video uh, deepfakes is the next big thing and um, it's already here, like the technology is already happening. So, you know, you can go onto YouTube and you can put in Barack Obama deepfake video and, you know, it's a video of Barack mm. Obama giving a speech with his voice and the technology matches the lip movements so that you know, the images superimposed over an actor's face or whichever, but their lip movement is matched to the speech that's coming out. Mm. So it looks like it's real. And so you know, what you do is you get someone who can mimic either technologically or actually Barack Obama's voice. And uh, having then laid down that soundtrack, you can get the deep fake to mimic exactly the lips. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the thing is, is that you don't even need impersonators anymore. It's very easy to replicate a voice now to very high fidelity and very high quality. Now, uh, the, the question you raised there of when Donald Trump was arrested uh, and then there were these uh, deep fakes uh, showing him actually being cuffed and all the rest of it. I mean, that is potentially dangerous because it could incite his base to violent action. Yeah. And I mean, when we look at any new technology, I mean, ever since humans first started chipping away at flint to create arrowheads, every new technology we have created has had the potential um, to be used for ill. And certainly this is, is no different in that sense. But again, if you compare it to the likes of Photoshop or something like that, is that, you know, technology exists that could be used to alter reality um, in a way that can incite uh, to nefarious action. But the problem is, is that this is so widespread and so ubiquitous and, you know, our critical thinking that we've developed over the last decade, say, in relation to images, doesn't exist when it comes to the sound of someone's voice mm. or the uh, a video image of someone speaking. Um, where do we go from here, though, if you can't tell whether something is true or false, whether it's a news story or an entertainment story? 
Where do we go? And I think that's going to be one of the most pressing issues, certainly for this decade. And, you know, we're hearing stories of very prominent AI researchers, you know, raising concerns around the preponderance of fake images, fake videos and text um, online. And certainly with children who are in school today, it's more important than ever, in my personal view, that critical thinking is something that um, children are enabled with because I think critical thinking is going to be extremely important going forward in trying to discern what's real and what's news. Mm. And, you know, we're in the era now of so-called fake news and, you know, it's a struggle to try and identify which sources of information we can rely on. And I think critical thinking is going to be enormously important. Uh, One of the issues, of course, is that when you get world leaders who actually tell lies, just straightforward lies, and um, then when you see a, a fake video that is also telling lies, you know, it is credible. No, absolutely. And I mean, n- no leaders in particular come to mind immediately. Um, but taking an example just completely randomly, like let's say Donald Trump, um, if, if there was a video of him saying something, um, y- you know, it'll be difficult to check whether or not he actually said it or whether you know, it was an AI and that's going to, I was actually thinking about this this morning, is that the the idea of papers of record, for example, is going to become extremely important because you'll need to verify what you're seeing going forward from different sources and from sources you trust. So you might see, for example, that video of Trump saying something and think to yourself, oh, he couldn't have actually said that. And you'd need to pool whatever resources you trust and to identify whether or not he actually said it. Mm. So, so that question of the paper of record, you know, the Irish Times, the paper of record, that kind of thing in terms of of, uh, you know, television news and so on, that you've got to trust your source. You go to Fox News and they obviously lied uh, about Dominion and they uh, had to settle that case at a massively huge cost. Um, But they, you know, said things they even didn't believe themselves. So what does that do to young people who are watching these news programmes on Fox and, and believing it all? In a sense, this technology has come at a bad point in in human history because we are just reached this point where you know the the word coined by the Americans truthiness um and what on what we could rely on in terms of news um became a little opaque um because you've got such biased news reporting particularly in the United States um and now this technology comes along which makes you question reality even further so i think um you know for example elon musk has this initiative on twitter or i think it's called community notes which it's all about fact checking so i think fact checking is going to become exceptionally important um going forward and exceptionally difficult absolutely as people are using the very tools that mislead them to fact check they go on search engines and uh, various browsers uh, to check something but if the browser itself contains the lies what then yeah, and it's not even lies i mean if you look at um bing which is microsoft search engine they have incorporated the open ai chat gpt technology into um the bing search engine so uh, i tried this out and and um the first thing i did that i think many people would do is is you know, searched themselves, and I did. And um, it told me that um, I was an expert in AI law, but it also told me that I was a former employee of William Fry, which was a little bit alarming. Um, <laughs> what did it know that I didn't know? Um, so, you know, the, the information coming from AI is like, they're great for general, you know, language, but when it comes to specifics, they're very poor. What about the, the legal pitfalls that uh, await? Because, um, you know, you, you are entitled to your own image rights, for example, but defending them could be expensive. It could be. I mean, you have to look at the different jurisdictions. Uh, the United States is a very advanced concept of personality rights, and there are a whole subset of rights in and to themselves where artists can um, protect their personality rights, be it their image, the sound of their voice. Um, Over here, we don't have as um, 
developed concept of personality rights. So let's say, if, if to give an example, in America there is there are famous cases. One of them is Bette Midler. Ford used um, Bette Midler's a sound like of Bette Midler singing um, in one of their commercials, and she she sued successfully. And similarly, Tom Waits and uh, took a case against Frito Lay Doritos because they used a sound like of him in a Doritos commercial. So over here we that was under the concept of personality rights. Over here, we'd use the idea of passing off. So if you're trying to pass off, you know, if somebody's singing in one of your commercials, it might be giving the impression that there's an endorsement, for example. And, you know, an example would be Rihanna sued Topshop because Topshop had um, a line of T-shirts with her face on it. And she said, oh, that's passing off and she's successful there. So... That's probably where we'd we'd lean towards on this side of the Atlantic. So, you know, there is this whole issue around potentially false endorsements or or especially celebrities being used to um, give their name to something that they actually haven't given their name to at all. Well, it's a, a strange world. Uh, and you wonder whether or not ultimately they're going to have to shut down the Internet to stop all of this. And, you know, people might have to pay to a- access the World Wide Web, which is, a, you know, maybe that's down the road. Anyway, look, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Barry Scannell, Senior Solicitor with William Fry's Technology Group.